Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a King Killer Chronicle reread podcast. We are your hosts, Will and Phoenix. Let's get into it. Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, episode 32, Chekhov's Bone Tar where we will be looking at chapters 66 and 67 of The Name of the Wind through the lens of The Bystander Effect. If you are new here, we would like to give you a short explanation of what you're about to listen to. Each week, we will be examining a section of the book, The Name of the Wind, through a chosen lens and figuring out what we can take from the text to apply to our real lives. We will also take some time to explore models of practical wisdom from the text with an Aristotelian for Nemos of the Week, after which we will expand our understanding of our own world with an interesting fact and wrap things up with seven words from the book and seven words from our own lives. Before we begin, let's get some disclaimers out of the way. First of all, as always, we are in no way affiliated with Patrick Rothfuss or his publisher, Daw Books. Second of all, our discussions are naturally going to assume that either A, you've already read the main books, The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear, as well as all the other ancillary novellas and short stories in the continuity, or you're a weirdo who lives in a four-dimensional world and perceives past, present, and future simultaneously, and thus there is no distinction between spoiler and not. Either way, spoilers ahead. Finally, as a word to our community, while it is perfectly fine to critique the text as you read it, we're not going to stand for any abuse of the author responsible for it. Now it's time for us to do a 45-second recap. This time, it's your turn. You got rhyming couplets for me? Oh, you better believe it. And I will not be eating the cherries. Tell you that right now. Don't you forking dare. Put those away. (laughs) Because this is an audio medium and not a visual medium, right now Phoenix is threateningly dangling a bag of cherry ripe at me. It's disgusting. It's also very, very out of date. Doubly disgusting. So, you got a timer ready? Of course not. You want to give me your phone so I can uh, time your demise? Here you go. In three, two, one, go. On the morning of his date, Quoth is making emitters, hoping he won't be late because he's not a quitter. When the bone tar canister cracks, there ensues a conflagration. Quoth quickly acts and saves fellow from ruination. The young lad wakes up in a sickbed, realizing he's missed his appointment. Mullah tells him to be glad he's not dead, and to his burns applies ointment. Though shoeless and ragged, he runs across the bridge, hoping that Den is lagged, but that hope has been fridged. Later, Kilvin and Quoth debrief to compare their wounds and express their relief at their clever use of runes. 29.31 seconds. No cherries for me. Put the ripe away. That sounds wrong. Look, I'm not the one who gave that candy a disgusting name, so... Fair enough. Oh well. No cherries for you. No cherries for me. One might think that you are engineering it so that you don't have to eat those things. Yes. Yes, I am. (laughs) What's the fun in that? Not eating cherries. But YouTube content. Uh, I would rather earn my cherries through genuine failure. Okay, fine. You win this time. Yes, I do. However, speaking of YouTube, as of the time of this recording, we have around 71-ish subscribers to our YouTube channel. And YouTube will not let us choose a URL until we have 100 subscribers. And I swear I will stop asking people to subscribe to the dang thing once I can change the stupid URL. Hint, 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 hint. Please, please, please look us up on YouTube at Tales from the Waystone and subscribe. And stay subscribed until we have 100 people. And then that way I can just get the thing done with. And I will be very, very happy, and I will be very, very thankful to all of you that decided to do that for us. Thank you. And if you need extra incentive, this upcoming week after we've recorded this, it's my birthday. And all I want 
is a vanity URL for our stupid YouTube channel. And with that little bit of shameless groveling out of the way, let's get into things. Okay. So this is where we finally get to the fireworks factory, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. And it's a doozy. There was no way that we were going to be introduced to the bone tar and have it just looming ominously in the fishery without something terrible happening. And in this case, and it seems to be through no fault of anyone's, just a freak accident. But I've got my own personal set of theories. So when Quoth mentions to Jackson that the canister looks unusually cold, and then Jackson responds, well, better too cold than the alternative, I started thinking, why did it get too cold? Well, then I did some digging onto the signs of the Chandrian, as you do any time there is something unexplainable within the Kingkiller Chronicle, and I discovered that one of the signs of the Chandrian is unnatural cold, courtesy of Ferul, a.k.a. Cinder. Which got me thinking, is it possible that perhaps our favorite Chandrian took a quick little swing by the fishery on his way into town and just so happened to get a little bit of cold on that canister? It's interesting that you point out Ferul. When earlier, when we were discussing this, you were also talking about how there is one of the Chandrian that corrodes metal. Yeah, I was initially thinking that, but then I started really reading into the descriptions, and there's not really any talk of corrosion on the part of the metal at all. There is talk of the sigildry being damaged. But that's about it. We don't really get much about metal corrosion, and there doesn't seem to be any additional metal corrosion to anything else within the fishery. But given just how delicate everything is, particularly around the bone tar, any slight variation in temperature would be enough just to tip it over the edge. Just something to keep in mind when we're going to see what happens later on in the chapter. Also, to note, the sympathy emitters are not orange. They're blue. <laughs> blue, blue flame. flame. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So yeah, there's a particular combination of effects that make you think that there may be something more going on here. And we'll get into the five whys a little bit further once we get to our debrief section. Let's go ahead and start with the beginning. So after his evening out with Denna, Kvothe spends the morning trying to earn a little bit of extra scratch by making some emitters. Because, let's face it, it's not cheap hanging out at the Aeolian every night. I would counter that. The Aeolian was cheap for him. It was free. Denna, <laughs> and uh, more importantly, trying to impress Denna, because I really don't think that Denna would have purposefully made him go broke. I think that that was mostly both being stupid. As one does when they are infatuated with someone and they want to impress them. I'm not really judging that part. It's more both. She probably would be willing to buy the bread herself. And let's be real, I can't really judge him too much on this. I know that when we first started going out, I spent a lot more money on us. I know, and I didn't necessarily want you to. But it's what's expected of men in our society, unfortunately. So to my mind, there are two absolute issues with this. One is, you're supposed to go broke? What? Why? And then the other one is, but... Maybe I wanted to pay for some of the stuff? Gender roles are stupid. They really are. And, you know, as we've grown together, we've established a little more equilibrium in that regard. Again, it's fun to go out and have a nice dinner with someone you're really interested in. So I can see the temptation. But you also gotta take care of your own self, dude. At any rate, Quoth's pocketbook is a lot lighter than he'd like. And he decides he's going to do a little bit of early morning work in the fishery. We get an explanation of why Kvothe never saw Fella in the fishery. Because differing schedules, differing shifts. Fella is probably a morning owl, where Kvothe seems to do most of his work in the fishery in the evenings. Both are valid schedules. We also get a little bit of a description of the dredge that Kilvin keeps on hand. And it's always telling whenever Quoth begins a sentence with, despite so-and-so's warning, he does that a lot. That basically could go in front of just about any of his actions. 
And in this case, it is, despite Manette's warning, I decided to make the blue emitters. Oops. In this case, not oops. Turns out he was the only one who actually wound up making blue emitters. So, as everything seems to serve Quoth's pocketbook in this story, so did this. And what's also telling is he noticed something that was out of the ordinary and made sure to bring it up to a supervisor. This is just good workplace safety. One example of him being a good worker, at the end of the chapter there is an example of him being an absolutely terrible worker of the fishery. I don't care who you are. I used to work at a grocery store. I had to wear stupid, ugly, uncomfortable shoes that were specifically from a catalog that was specifically workwear because they had steel toes and rubber soles so I wouldn't slip and I wouldn't crush my feet. That's important. Proper footwear goes a long way. And he goes barefoot at the end of this after he broke a glass cistern of water all over the floor and there's toxic crap all over. What in the hell? We'll get to that later. <laughs> we will, but that is, I just... Mm. <laughs> yeah, but as I say, when you see something like this, an unsafe condition in a workplace, it's very important to say something about it. And this is something that is counter to the bystander effect that a lot of other people fall into in this chapter. Like Jackson, who basically just shrugs it off. Can you get a definition, actually, of the bystander effect? Yeah. The bystander effect is a social psychological theory that states that individuals are less likely to offer help to a victim when there are other people present, and the greater the number of bystanders, the less likely it is that one of them will help. And several factors can contribute to it, including ambiguity, group cohesiveness, and diffusion of responsibility that reinforce mutual denial of a situation's severity. And so, in a lot of stories, your main protagonist is almost never a bystander. Oftentimes, bystander effect only applies to protagonists before the call to adventure has been accepted, and it's usually them falling victim to the bystander effect that leads them to take a more proactive role going forward. Case in point, consider Spider-Man who's catalyzed by the bystander effect after his inaction leads to Uncle Ben's death. Another example of this would be in Star Wars, which is kind of your Urtext hero's journey where Luke Skywalker is resistant to the call to adventure and he's hesitant to go off and join the rebellion and he denies that there's a problem until after the Empire kills Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. In this case, Quoth has already had his call to adventure moment where he realizes inaction isn't an option. Though, for him, that period of time is long. The story, I don't think, follows the hero's journey quite so rigidly. Jackson's response is, well, if it was really a problem, somebody else would have said something too. Which is pretty much the definition of the bystander effect. You don't think it's your responsibility because somebody else is going to be responsible for it. And if it was really a problem, more than one person would say something about it. And it's sort of a false democratization of catastrophe. <laughs> You're assuming that if the majority of people aren't saying anything about it, it's not really a problem. I like that definition. But what my point was earlier is that when you have your main protagonist in the meat of the story, they are very rarely going to be the person that just stands back and watches, you know, is a bystander to the catastrophe. It might be that they are earlier in the story and that that can be the catalyst for them changing. But once they are really, really in that meat of the story, if something happens in their vicinity, they are almost always going to be the person that does something about it. And if they aren't, it's typically through circumstances beyond their control. Like someone is holding them back, specifically preventing them from acting. And it makes sense. It's more interesting to hear about people doing things than not doing things. There's only so many times that you can have your main character just not rescue the person from the burning caustic fire flame. That's not a good story. <laughs> no. 
I would say, though, that in some stories where authors are trying to subvert the narrative, they might do that more. It's more common with people who they're specifically identifying as antiheroes, certainly. I'd agree with that. And to the point of Foth is definitely the protagonist and the hero of this story, but in keeping with the fact that this particular story is written by someone who, and told from the perspective of someone who, would like you to believe that he is not a hero, like capital H, hero. He even says something to the effect of, well, but I'm not Prince Gallant, and I didn't gracefully perform this act of heroism. In fact, I was a bumbling idiot, but I still did it. However, in real life, it is much, much more likely that people will feel frozen and unable to act rather than be spurred to action by an event that would scare the Jesus out of anybody. So here we see Quoth taking action quickly and making do with what he's got. And this is actually something I think that is admirable about him. I admire the way he behaves in this situation. He recognizes that one of his fellow students is trapped and he has something that will at least help get her out of there. It won't be pretty and it'll probably hurt, but they'll both be able to at least survive. And it's important to remember that at this point, Quoth identifies himself more as a survivor than as a hero. And so his action to first break the drench and cover himself in water and also risk binders chills while reckless certainly beats the alternative of doing nothing. One thing I would like to point out that happens before Catastrophe that was really powerful when I listened to it the first time. Quoth is focused on what he's doing and all of a sudden, not loudly, someone behind him just says, Oh. My. God. And I don't know if you've ever been in that kind of situation where you've been really, really focused on something and then somebody just breaks your concentration with, we are about to be forked. Yeah, I know that feeling. You can see everything happening in slow motion. And <laughs> if this were a movie, the whole thing would have slowed down just at this point And the person's voice would have been... <laughs> and of course, the person stuck and about to be burned alive go up in flames like a matchstick, is Fella, who, while dressed practically, is also in a society where women's clothes are still going to be kind of flowy and airy and easily flammable. The descriptions of the fishery and the precautions made by the people who built it are so detailed and give you that effect of everything slowing down. They don't just do the action in a paragraph. You know that this is happening. You know that you are dreading this. You don't know what's about to happen. Things, because of all the words, are giving you time to think and breathe and go, but I need to get to that end of that thing so that I know what happens and so I know that fella doesn't die. And oh my God, I need to make sure that this is going to be, ah! And I think that that's kind of a bit of genius in storytelling. you got to figure between the time that Kvothe notices something is really wrong and the time when the rubber hits the road and we finally get our big conflagration, that's a matter of seconds, but it takes Kvothe a couple minutes to describe all of this. I'm going to say, so while it happened in seconds and everything needed to happen quite fast, we get three pages of description on this thing that happened in probably that amount of time. Yeah, it's some quick thinking on Quoth's part, certainly. Kudos to him. So he manages to figure out a quick and dirty way to break the dredge and get himself soaked. Hey, that's some really smart thinking on his part. 
And I've noticed in my own life, when called to act quickly, it feels like time does dilate a little bit and that I am able to more quickly go through my options and try to take care of something very, 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 you know, snap, 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 snap. You kind of go into this tunnel vision and you might not find the optimal solution. In fact, you probably didn't find the optimal solution, but you find a solution that works. And this solution does at least help out. And I gotta say, those binders chills probably at least also helped keep his core temperature down a little bit in the face of all the fire. Caustic fire fog, yes. So he manages to soak his cloak and make a run through the fire, grab Fella, carry her like a sack of potatoes out, <laughs> and fully escape. Hey, you know, no one ends up ultimately getting hurt by the thing. Well, nobody ends up killed. So, on one hand, I'm kind of annoyed that it was a woman that was the one that had to be rescued. On the other hand, though, she's not simpering. She's not freaking out, like, having a panic attack and being useless. She didn't fight. None of that. At that point, she doesn't have a choice to try to be self-rescuing princess. She's trapped. She is legitimately trapped. There's not really a way for her to get untrapped by herself. And to her credit, she recognizes what Quoth is trying to do to help her and goes along with it pretty easily. So Quoth says, I didn't carry her out like some Prince Gallant from a storybook. And because of my dyslexia, I have a hard time reading some words as the words they are. And my brain... Just insta-fills gallivant. <laughs> Which fits. I mean, gallivant is that kind of character to a T. Yes. <laughs> and if you haven't watched the show, it is a criminal injustice that it is not a longer series. But it is so fun. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Anyway, it's definitely to his credit that he risked himself to save someone else. And this is really our first instance where Quoth's actions are specifically to help someone else and not just for his own gain or survival or for his own vanity. Consider all of his other instances of notable activity. Well, they're about bearing a petty grudge against a professor. They're about doing something stupid in the library. They're about doing something cool at the Aeolian. This is the first time we've seen him really go out of his way and take a risk to help someone else. And he doesn't even really internalize and or recognize that until much later in the day. I think it's a sign of maturity that he recognizes that, hey, that was the right thing to do. This would be the right thing to do if that were Will or Sim or literally anybody else. Hell, it would be the right thing to do if it was Ambrose. In Seven Word Territory Land, I knew what I had to do. He says that, and as easy as that, I knew what I had to do. Which, that's pretty much just shorthand for protagonist. Yeah, exactly. Protagonists don't spend a whole lot of time agonizing over what is the right course of action. They usually just take the right course of action. Unless the story calls for them to sit with their feelings and war over potentials. We get a little bit of time in the Medica. Mola is not making a big deal over having to treat Kvoth. And she is definitely not fawning over him or his actions. She's matter of fact. She's fixed him up, has a pleasant, if short, conversation with him. Both, for once, seems very respectful of another woman, like treating her as an equal kind of respectful. He specifically says, hey, I heard you got promoted to Alpha. Everyone knows you deserved it a long time ago. I love this interaction. He's sitting there pretty much naked under a sheet being treated and he took in lungs full of corrosive fog and ammonia and 
is bumped and bruised and burned. And he's just nice to her. And their interaction is pretty emblematic of how Mola is. And she reminds me of a lot of nurses I've known. She's seen just about everything, so you can't shock her with anything. <laughs> you also can't gross her out with anything. Right. For her, it's all just very matter-of-fact. She's not unsympathetic and not unkind, but she's just not going to be going out of her way to say, oh, that's terrible and shocking. She's like, we got you taken care of. You're fine. <laughs> Fella's good. People in the fishery are fine. Thank you for caring. And she's doing her job. And then Sim and Will show up, kind of as a little bit of comic relief. You can imagine that they're relieved to find that their friend is okay after all of this. I mean, I know that if a friend of mine had gotten out of a fire like that, even if there were no major injuries, I'd be worried as all get out. They've also swung by anchors to pick up a spare change of clothes for him. But unfortunately, of course, he has no shoes now. He also had very little clothing left. He's got, like, one suit of clothing left. I'm glad that he has more than one pair of pants. Fortunate for him. I know people who don't have more than one pair of pants. Hell, I've got multiple pairs of pants, but I wear the same pair of pants just about every day anyway, so... For me, I've got a pair of pants that I wear during the winter, and I've got a pair of shorts that I wear during the summer, and I'm good. Same. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's good that he owns more. Yeah, always good to have a backup. And then we get introduced to Kvothe the Barefoot. Yeah, he runs all the way back to the Aeolian Barefoot, which, you gotta figure, that hurts. It's been, what, six months since he was off of the street in Centarbian, and... oh, I just realized something. That the shoes that got ruined were the shoes that that cobbler gave him. Yeah... One of the things that I notice is that pretty much every hero's boon that Quoth acquires is something that he'll ultimately lose through not really anything terribly exciting. He ran through a fire in the fishery, and you don't think that that's terribly exciting? Okay, maybe I'm overstating it, but let's put it this way. We don't find out about the loss until after it occurs, typically, with most of these things. Which is telling. Usually the loss of a hero's boon is something that you find out as it's happening. I gotcha. Though in this case it really is just a pair of shoes. But he also doesn't seem to have any of those, aw, but the nice person gave me this. I also noticed that Will and Sim, who are pretty well off, don't offer to help him get a new pair. Or more clothes. Right? Hmm. Meh. Hmm. Meh. Though, to be fair, I don't think that it would have occurred to me right away, either. It probably would have occurred at least at some point. But I would have loved it if they go, Oh yeah, we bought you new clothes. And new shoes. But then we also wouldn't get workplace safety violation. Yeah. So at any point, he arrives back at the Aeolian, only to find... Nope, Den is left. Two hours late, and... She's gone bye bye bye. <laughs> bye bye bye. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that was great. I'm keeping that in. All right, cool. <laughs> All right. Yeah, she's gone bye bye bye, and <laughs> she's gone bye bye bye. <laughs> Is there a better word? No, there isn't. And Diox says that she's left with a white-haired gentleman. You know, old, rich, patron material. So. Remember how we were mentioning that there may have been a visit by a certain white-haired gentleman who carries cold with him everywhere? And blue flame? Makes you wonder if maybe he was intentionally trying to delay Quoth so that he could get Denna as his apprentice. I mean, that would be a lot of very careful setup that currently has no payoff. But... I mean, the Chandrian are all about doing all sorts of weird things for no discernible reason that have no real motivation that anyone can actually determine. At least with the amount of books we have currently. I mean, they're basically just chaotic evil, so... The entire thing is, what's their plan? No one knows! <laughs> they just do things. <laughs> okay. 
to wrap the chapter up, Foth limps his little butt back to Anchors, sits in a corner, and hears everybody extol on his heroism. And he once again says, just like Prince Gallant out of some storybook. And I think at this point, he's starting to recognize the difference between being talked about and being liked. What I also find kind of interesting about that, you've got all of these people that now have this story about how he saved Fella from the burning fishery. They're embellishing it. They're saying the details differently. The main crux of the story is there. Quoth runs through fire, saves Fella. So the action of the story is there. The details about how he did all of this are different. And so while he's telling this story to Chronicler in the inn, Chronicler may have heard this story with a completely different set of details. Because that's the legend. That's the myth that's being perpetuated throughout the Four Corners. But this kind of gives me the same vibe of the Three Little Pigs versus the true story of the Three Little Pigs, which is told from the wolf's perspective. And that's why Chronicler is interviewing both. He's heard the legends and he wants to hear what does the subject actually have to say about them. We also, though, know that Quoth is a historically unreliable narrator. So sometimes those inaccuracies reveal more about him than what he says specifically. Because those inaccuracies tell us what Quoth wants to believe about himself. The next chapter mostly revolves around Quoth's interactions with Kilvin after the fire. As I've stated before, workplace violation, no shoes in the fishery, what the hell? Not even sandals. Nothing. Not even just, like, paper. Nothing. But I was going to make a point that I didn't make before, so I do want to make it now. When Quoth was living on the streets in Tarbian, he did not have shoes. And the soles of his feet toughened up to the point where I'm not sure that his walk to Emre actually hurt his feet. But I'm pretty damn sure that if he steps on a piece of glass, he's going to probably kill his foot. Not to mention all the other chemicals and reagents and other mishigas that's all over the floor here. I'm not 100% certain that he is as calloused anymore as he thinks he is, though. You and I both play guitar. The more you play, the more calluses get on your fingers. The less you play, the less calluses there are on your fingers. They kind of go away. They don't go away completely. I know that... I haven't played my guitar as often as I would like to. And my fingertips are a lot more sensitive right now. But on my left hand, they are definitely thicker than on my right. So after slaving away and trying to fumble through the final emitters, which he's doing with a bandage on his thumb too, which that's no fun. Absolutely. Have you ever tried to play the piano with a bandage on your thumb? No, because I don't play piano, but I've tried playing guitar with a bandage on my pinky, and it is weird. Even if it's on my strumming hand, not my fretting hand. He does succeed in this, which again is how he gets more money later after this chapter. We'll probably point it out again, because he likes to point it out every time that he makes money and spends money. The ledger must be balanced. I like the image of Kilvin coming into the fishery, being trailed by medical students, trying to get him to stop. Yeah, with his mittened hands, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like lobster claws. A little bit, yeah. I picture him walking around with, like, oven mitts. <laughs> like white oven mitts. Yep. They're going to be gross and gray and disgusting soon because he is not not going to touch everything in the fishery. And then we get a bit where Kilvin and Quoth have an after-action review of what happened. So in my other life, I work as an IT major incident manager. And after a lot of the major incidents we have, we'll hold an after-action review where all of the stakeholders and engineers and pretty much anyone who had a hand in any of the activity, they all come together and talk about what worked, what didn't work. And then for those things that worked, how did we know to do those things? What are the things that we can do to make sure that that happens more frequently? 
how can we know better about what happened? And this is where we talk about the five whys. So the first why that you get is, why did the thing happen? I would love it if you could do the five whys specifically to this situation. Let's go through that. So our first why, the canister was cold, which caused the canister to crack and then shatter the vial within, and then boosh. So that's our first why. Second why would be, well, why did the canister get so cold? And I don't know that we ever really get a satisfactory answer on that. The assumption is that there was something wrong with the signaldry, but that whole canister is shattered at this point. There's no way to tell. And since signaldry is relatively static, it's not like that signaldry could just suddenly be changed. Unless someone went and like scratched something else or changed the signaldry on it purposefully. Right. There would have to be an outside actor that specifically changes the signaldry or changes the environment within which the signaldry is working. So, for instance, someone introducing unnatural cold into it. For instance. For instance. All right, next why. So we could theorize that our third why is some outside actor, perhaps malicious, perhaps Chandrian, perhaps accidental, changes the signaldry or introduces unnatural cold. I think other whys are... Why does Fella feel like she has to work in a far off section of the fishery that just happens to be in between two drains and channels that go towards those drains and would block off her access to get, I don't know, out? One would also ask, why isn't there an exit available in every single section so that if someone did get blocked out by said channels, they could still get out? Why did you put a work desk there? OSHA requirements. Exactly. You have to have an emergency exit from any given spot in a building. Even if it's just an egress window. That stuff's important. It's why you can't call a windowless room a bedroom. More about why I absolutely adore Kilvin, although if I were Kilvin's student, I would be having panic attacks. And that's not hyperbole. I would probably be having a panic attack as soon as he brought up anything. I seem to recall exactly that happening on a few occasions Phoenix, can I talk to you for a second? Alarm bells, oh my god, no, ah, ah, ah. Anyway, Kilvin does the thing where he's like, Alir Quoth, I found your thieves' lamp. We talked about this. And instead of Quoth rationally going, but, I, I, but, but, what? <laughs> he's like, oh no, I'm in trouble for the fact that I left that somewhere, instead of, I saved someone's life, it's kind of worth it. <laughs> yeah, it would be like getting mad at a kid for getting their cell phone wet while they're saving a drowning person. It's fundamentally ridiculous. And Kilvin knows this, and he's hoping Quoth will recognize that he's being silly here. He's just messing with him. Kilvin actually has to say, but I'm joking with you, of course. Thank you very much for making sure that our friend didn't die. He also manages to give Quoth some good, constructive talk about his actions and say, hey, you acted when nobody else did. Thank you for calling out that there was something wrong. I'm going to talk with Jackson, my Elta, who I'm responsible for, because he let it just go on without calling out the danger after being alerted. During this little debrief section, we get something that kind of stood out to me. Quoth says, you seem like you're in a good mood. To which Kilvin replies, I am. Do you know the saying, Chan Vayan Aiden Coat? Yes, I noticed that last word too. I also recognize the first word. Chan. Chan Vayan. Chandrian. Chan Vayan Aiden Coat. Which means expect disaster every seven years. And there we have that Chan part. Seven. Which means that probably coat means disaster. It's what I would expect. So I'm curious what disaster turned Quoth into coat. Or what disaster coat portends. And we also see just how prepared Kilvin has been all along for anything to happen. Again, this speaks to Kilvin's credit. He's got numerous safety measures designed to help 
contain damage that might happen from any number of things. Fire is the least of his worries, it turns out. <laughs> Something that might be a little self-serving to Quoth, but also might be a selfless offer. He offers to be Master Kilvin's hands for any work that he has to do around the fishery, considering that Kilvin's hands are currently oven mitts. I think also a little self-serving, but I think it is a genuine offer because I think he does feel an affection for Kilvin. I also think that maybe he feels a little responsible because despite the fact that he brought it up with Jackson, Kvothe did not bring it up to Kilvin, who is the person that has much more expertise and is ultimately responsible for all of the students in the fishery. So he may feel a little bit like this disaster was on his shoulders more than he feels the heroism on his shoulders for saving Fella. And then we get a hint that Kilvin is working on things that would be unwise to teach to an Illyr. Then you should promote me to Rilar. That's seven words. And I think it's a nice little turnaround, like quick cleverness, which, I mean, occasionally I can do that. Sometimes I'm just like this bumbling idiot of going through life trying to think of good retorts and comebacks and things. And then sometimes it just flash in the pan instant response. I hear ya. And Kilvin is not opposed to this. He recognized that Quoth took some pretty severe risks of his own to help a fellow student, and without his quick thinking, Fella could very well have been dead, which would have ultimately landed on Kilvin's head in terms of how he thinks of the world. In the last couple of pages, there's talk between Kilvin and Quoth about how events like this can be retold and retold with different details. Again, kind of mirroring the end of the last chapter, where rumor and myth and story take an event and run with it. One might think from all the stories that Kilvin knows the name of fire. He does not. Elodin knows the name of fire. He was not there. There are other ways to handle these events that, while still magical in nature and somewhat engineering in nature, are not calling the name of the whatever, like Taberlin the Great. Yeah, he describes it in a more mechanistic fashion. You get the sense that Elodin would have just walked in and told the bone tar to sit up and beg. Roll over. Now back in the jar. Okay, cool. Fixed. I don't know if he knows the name of Bonetar. But he would have figured it out. But he does know the name of Fire, and he could have probably squashed to that. Instead, Kilvin has to rely on more industrial means that he's prepared for just this sort of eventuality. A heat eater. We never get any explanation of what it is, just that it eats heat. <laughs> I mean, do we really need a mechanical explanation of what a heat eater is? I like having the ambiguity. <laughs> Me too. Again, its name is descriptive enough. It eats heat, so we assume that it ate the heat. <laughs> they talk about how Kilvin was able to quickly divert the disaster, but not easily. Which I think Quoth really needs to internalize kind of that devil's triangle a bit. So in this particular case, it's a triangle... You can pick two. Quick, easy, and effective. In this case, it was quick and effective, but not easy. And I think the same would be for Quoth's actions, too. They were quick, they were effective, but I don't think it was at all easy for him. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. I think Quoth may downplay in his story to Chronicler the effects of having to be repaired in the Medica. If it were that easy, he probably wouldn't have passed out and dropped Fella and had to wind up having all of his clothes thrown away. 
I think it also is useful here because sometimes when you see someone who is incredibly competent, they make things look easy that are actually quite difficult. And so then when you have a hard time doing the same actions, you beat yourself up over it. So when Kilvin says, it was quick, but it was not easy, what this does is it says, okay, if you are not able to do so, it is not through any deficiency on your part. It's because what I was doing was hard. I would like you to remember this the next time that I build furniture. <laughs> For me, I have a much more mechanical way of looking at things than you do. I also have a lot more experience because growing up, I was the only one that was going to do it in my household, so I did. The thing about it is that my colossal mess up happened when I was 10 years old and the first time I tried to build a piece of furniture on my own because I was 10 and I was overly confident. It was terrible. I screwed that up so, so much. Much like your brother with the walkie-talkie and going, oh, I know what's wrong with this. Snip. If you don't know that story, I think that particular story might be in a bonus pod on our Patreon. Patreon.com slash pod. Should you want to know about it? Not going into it. Anyway, I was overly confident. I thought that I could do it. The adults, quote, in my household let me because they were definitely not going to be able to build this thing either. I've learned a lot since then. And of the two of us, I am much, much, much more comfortable with things that are requiring building instructions. And that's okay. Yeah. And it's okay to admit that things are harder than they look. I mean, if you ever watch professional athletes do anything, they make it look really easy. Or if you ever watch a Twitch stream of someone drawing, they make it look really easy. Draw a circle, draw another circle, now draw the rest of the owl. Or you listen to a great musician or you watch them and they're just sitting there playing their instruments like it's no big deal. And it takes a lot of practice and preparation to get to that level. And you're never going to be that right out of the gate. And let's not forget, Kvothe is still a beginner at this point. He's barely out of his apprenticeship. He learns things quickly, but also shallowly. He's just dipping his toe into the waters here. He hasn't really challenged himself. And on that note, it is time for us to continue on to our Fernemos. I believe that is your turn. I believe you are correct. So, who you got? Far be it from me to pick the same person for the second time in a row. I mean, you picked it last time and I picked it this time. I think you picked him the time before as well. I could probably go back and look and see if I did pick Master Kilvin <laughs> a few episodes ago also. But the thing is, if for no other reason he points out that Kvothe is not wearing shoes and that that is a really stupid thing to do in the fishery. If anyone would know, it would be Kilvin. Yeah, Kilvin strikes me as someone who probably has learned some of these lessons the hard way. Oven mitt hands and all. <laughs> I think we've gone on at length about why Kilvin is exuding practical wisdom throughout this whole last hundred pages, even. The man is thoughtful and really smart. And I think also there is a tendency that we all have to assume that people who are from a different culture are not going to necessarily be as smart as we are. And Kilvin is childish, and he is, well, not a master at the language, proving himself to be this savant when it comes to mechanical engineering and sigildry. There is a reason that he is a master at the university. You know, I'm not proud of this, but I have had instances where I have assumed that just because someone is less good at English, I am not claiming to be very good at speaking my own native language, but yeah. But just because someone is speaking 
English as their second or third or however many down the line language, which not for nothing is very impressive because English is hard and a lot of native English speakers can't do it. And two, that means that they already know their own native language and now have chosen to learn this piece of garbage language. But there is this idea that just because someone is not fluent in the language you are speaking, that somehow that means that they are not smart. And that's a really dangerous, terribly racist thing to do. That I've fallen into things where, because I feel like I have to find different words that are less complex to explain an idea, that that means that the person doesn't understand the more complex concept when it might just be that we don't have the same words to explain between the two of us. But when I listened to The Name of the Wind for the first time, and Nick Podell did a fantastic job of making different accents for the different locations and people that came from other places, there is this rough burr in Kilvin's language that you might not necessarily associate with people that you think are intelligent. And I'm talking about like this accent versus like an English accent. Like in the United States of America, we take anything that sounds like an English accent and think that they're smarter. <laughs> and I think that that's unfair. I think it's very unfair, but I still think it happens. And Kilvin, I like how he's written about because he's so competent and so capable. And he also brings up things that our hot-headed protagonist just doesn't think about, like shoes. He is, in fact, literally the definition of a practically wise person because he is both practical and wise. So Kilvin will show up in this often. Maybe we call this the Master Kilvin Award for Frenemos of the Week. <laughs> I like that. 32 episodes in and we have changed the name of this segment. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. All right. And with that, speaking of masters at the university, it's time for us to take to heart some of the lessons of another master, namely <laughs> Master Elodin and discuss an interesting fact of the week. It is your turn. So this week, I'm going to talk to you about a controversial subject, dinosaurs. Because you know that I'm not going to make you eat cherries when you talk about dinosaurs? Yes, I know what I'm about. <laughs> it's almost like I know my partner. <laughs> so specifically, we're going to be talking about the Dilophosaurus, which, if you might remember from Jurassic Park, you last saw spitting on and then eating a unscrupulous IT worker. A little bit of uh, internalization going on there? No. No, this is just literally Dennis Nedry's whole shtick. He's an unscrupulous, disgruntled IT worker. Anyway, so you picture probably a small frilled creature with poison glands. Now, the thing is, there has been no fossil evidence whatsoever for either the frill or the spitting. And there's a reason why Michael Crichton, the author of Jurassic Park, invented those. See, when Crichton was writing the book, one of the things that puzzled him was that the Dilophosaurus was effectively an apex predator of its time, but it seemed to be relatively small and with a comparatively weak bite strength for a creature of its size. So how could it possibly actually fulfill that niche within the food chain? So he theorized, well, hey, maybe it makes itself look bigger through a frill that it can expand, and then it can spit venom, which will help digest its food externally so it doesn't have to actually bite down on it to finish its meal off. So now that brings us to the question, why did Michael Crichton believe that? Again, we're going into our whys here. And the fact is that when the first Dilophosaurus skeletons were found on Navajo land, they only found an incomplete skeleton, and so paleontologists took other bones from other dinosaurs of the age and just kind of made casts of those and inserted them in. So as a result, we had an incomplete model that had been filled in with stuff that didn't actually match or fit. Okay, that sounds so, so sketchy. And I, that 
in itself, that fact is interesting enough where you don't have to have cherries, but I want to hear the rest of this. What the hell, scientists? Again, the 1900s, especially in paleontology, were kind of a gold rush era where there were people just as eager to get in and get a museum-worthy piece as they were to actually discover the truth about these creatures that existed millions of years ago. Oh my god. And not to mention, again, a lot of this happening on tribal lands, and they would right. take ownership of these relics that they had no claim to. Anyway. I want to hear more about this. Okay, so it'd be all well and good if you were to have a clear marker that this is an extrapolation and this is an actual fossil, right? But subsequent recreations didn't actually make that distinction because everything was a cast of an existing thing. It just kept being casts of casts and it turned into sort of this weird photocopy of a photocopy thing where our actual picture of what was there degraded to the point where we couldn't tell the difference between things that we just hypothesized about and made a loosely educated guess and things that we actually knew. So this resulted in our picture of an undersized creature that had basically a weak bite and didn't actually make sense. So recently, paleontologists managed to find a real honest to Zod, full, complete Dilophosaurus skeleton. And what they found is that instead of being a small little thing that could fit in a Jeep and eat an IT worker by spitting on it, they found this thing was actually like 20 feet long and <laughs> about half the size of a T-Rex and had a bite strength that could tear through a sauropod's neck. Turns out, yeah, this thing actually did live up to the hype and didn't need any extra frills or poison to do it. Like I said, you already got me with the fact that scientists made so much sure. shit up. So you don't have to eat any cherries, but the rest of that was also quite interesting. I will say this though, if your next interesting fact is about dinosaurs, you get to tell it to me, and then you get to tell me another fact. No promises. I will just claim that it's not interesting. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Find something else! All right. So with that, I believe it's time for us to discuss our seven words. You have the seven words from the book? I do. I was kind of tied between a couple, like I so often am. I thought about what I can make, I can break. Talking about the twice tough glass. It was interesting. But what I would rather choose is, where do you think stories come from? Because there are so many instances in these two chapters of people taking the event and turning it into a story. And in fact, that's the crux of this entire book. Anything else to add? I think you hit the nail on the head. Thank you. Now it is your turn to pick seven words from our lives. So when we were preparing this episode, it was the day of the North London Derby between my beloved Tottenham Hotspur and our most hated foes, Arsenal. And it got me thinking about my absolute favorite sentence in the English language. And it is this. It would get even worse for Arsenal. <laughs> that is your favorite sentence in the entire English language. There is no other sentence that fills me with more joy than that seven-word sentence right there. Wow. Way to tell that to your wife. I mean, you're great. You tell me all kinds of things that make me smile. But that? Oh, man. It warms the cockles of the heart. I don't know how I should feel about this. Lucky? You landed a catch. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you for potting with me. And thank you for potting with me. Join us next week on Tales from the Waystone as we discuss Chapter 68 of The Name of the Wind through the lens of tunnel vision. We would like to extend a huge thank you to our friend, Shawnee Jang, for our theme music. And many thanks to Patrick Rothfuss for creating a world that we've enjoyed exploring. Audio production, editing, and social media coordination, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. And project management and writing, courtesy of me, Will McCullough. 
If you would like to help support us and have the means to do so, please become a patron on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash waystonepod, where you can get early access to our show, our show notes, custom digital posters, exclusive Patreon-only bonus pods, and other exciting items. And as always, here's to one more day above the roses. To one more day above the roses. Ding! Ding. We'll discuss the five whys when we get to the debrief chapter with Kilvin here in a bit. Like, will we... T- well, I wanted to make sure it is whys, <laughs> not the letter. Let's go ahead and say it again. All right. We'll get more to the five whys later. Please don't say whys <laughs> like that. All right. Sorry.